So looking at these two so-called moral decision-making models, uh, let's call the first one Kantianism, and the second one we can call consequentialism. You might more often encounter it uh, in the form of utilitarianism, but pretty much, I would say, practically speaking, the same thing. Uh, both of these are the outcome of pretty well-developed moral philosophies with um, extensive discussion and defense of their theoretical foundations, which we're going to skip and, and just see what they offer us in terms of uh, their practical value, uh, because uh, the idea is that each of them does give us, offer us, a certain way for figuring out what the right thing to do is. And that's the presumption here that we're interested in finding out what the right thing to do is, because um, we want to do the right thing. Uh, so Kant and utilitarianism both, I would say, as I said in the last essay, uh, have their starting points in some pre-existing moral intuitions that we have. And let me s try to characterize both. Um, what do you think of it? Uh, Kant's version of morality is morality is about doing the right thing, no matter what. And that means, in his way of thinking, about doing things out of duty to the moral law. But, but doing the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing, and that's it. And then the notion is there is a right thing to do. Utilitarianism or consequentialism, um, I would say that the intuition that that works on is the idea that we want to achieve the best outcome for ourselves and everyone else involved. That we want to do good. And that doing good means preserving and promoting the happiness of everyone involved. I think that we're all familiar with, just from our own thinking about life and, and, and our, uh, our actions and the significance of our actions, we're, we're, both, we're, all, we're familiar with both of those intuitions. We have them. And uh, the strange thing about Kant and utilitarianism is especially Kant rejects utilitarianism altogether. Uh, for Kant, the morality of an action is not determined by its consequences at all, and it's certainly not determined by its effect on human happiness. Uh, for Kant, the, the whole... The, the criterion by which we judge whether an action is moral or not is whether it is done out of a good will or done with good will. So one could characterize good actions for him as ones that are done out of a good will. Um, so if we look at the excerpt that I gave you, what we get are two rules that one can apply um, to make sure that your actions are done out of goodwill. And these are put in terms of what he calls the categorical imperatives. Let's break that down a little bit. Uh, what is an imperative? An imperative is a grammatical term, right? It's actually a grammatical mood uh, that uh, signifies that language is being used to order or command. Eat your vegetables is uh, an imperative. Don't walk on the grass is a, an imperative. Watch out for that truck is an imperative, an order or a command to do or to re refrain from doing a certain thing. Categorical means absolute, um, unqualified, unconditional, and exceptionalist. So a categorical imperative would be a command that we must follow without exception and without taking into consideration uh, really any other circumstances, uh, the results of our actions. And, you know, it's just an order or command that we must follow. And, and what Kant offers in the brief excerpt I gave you are two versions of, of what such a command or a categorical imperative would look like. Uh, the first one, uh, let's say, has to do with universalizability, which is a big gulp of a word, but mm, he says, uh, if you're interested in finding out whether your action is, is a, a moral one, then ask yourself this. Ask whether the maxim, and we'll talk about that, the maxim of your action can be made a law for everyone. If the maxim or the rule or by which you are uh, behaving can, in your rational consideration of the matter, be made a rule for everyone and you would feel comfortable with everyone acting as you do, that is, if you consider yourself a kind of a universal legislator 
lawmaker here. If you can feel comfortable with this being a law for everyone, and you, as a rational creature, saying to everyone else, you should act this way, if you, can, if you feel comfortable with that, or if you assess that that is valid to do, then your action will be moral. If you cannot, in good conscience, uh, will that everyone acts according to the rule by which you're acting, then you know that you can't do it, at least can't do it morally. Um, this is a very famous and one might say infamous uh, idea. Um, it has to be applied. Now, Kant applied in certain ways, uh, having to do with you know lying. He thought lying was was always wrong because one could never will that that uh, lie that that the right to lie be followed by everyone. Um, but let's think of you know I don't know um, particular circumstances like. Like like uh, Chris's decision to drive drunk. I mean, if you can still think rationally as you're heading towards your car from the bar when you're drunk, and you're thinking of getting in the car, and you have maybe compelling reasons to do so, you need to get home, you know, practical matters. Uh, you ask yourself this: What is the general rule by which I'm acting here? The maxim of action, and can I will it to be a law for everyone? So let's take a stab at what the general rule would look like. Uh, if I were to drive drunk, then my rule would be that uh, when you are inebriated and your faculties are diminished, that it is permissible to operate a large motor vehicle which is potentially lethal to other human beings. Okay? So that, if that's the rule, then you ask yourself, can I will that everyone follow this rule? That it is okay when your faculties are diminished to operate a large mechanical vehicle that is potentially lethal to other human beings. Now Kant would say that a moment's reflection on this tells you, no, you, you cannot will that, that everyone follow this rule. You cannot legislate it for all other human beings. And, and therefore, you know that you can't drive drunk. At least you can't do it morally. Now the question is, you know, OK, you can do it, but you'd have to admit that it's an immoral action, that you are making an exception for yourself, and that it's morally indefensible. Uh, so I think that that's a pretty interesting thing to think about, whether, whether our actions are universalizable, whether we believe that we can, in good conscience, make our rule of action a rule for everyone to follow. The second version of the mechanical imperative is, is, is quite different, but it should lead you to the same results. And, and the second version has to do with the distinction between persons and things. If we look at that excerpt, it's just taken out of context. The context is that Kant is, who, who believes that, uni that morality is universal and absolute. He, he believes that, that, but he believes that in order to establish that, he's got to find something in the world uh, which is inherently valuable and not just relatively or conditionally valuable. Now, something that would be relatively or conditionally valued would be something like a hamburger or a pen uh, or a dollar. That is, things that have no inherent worth, but have worth if there is somebody who wants them. That is, they have conditional relative value. They have value, yes, but let's say that hamburger has value on the condition that there's somebody who wants to eat it. If no one is hungry or no one eats meat, then the hamburger is useless and has no value. So it has only conditional value on the condition that somebody wants it, or relative value, value not in itself, not objective inherent value, but value relative to somebody who wants it. So Kant believes that if everything was like that, if everything had only conditional value, then there could be no morality. So he asks himself, is there anything in the world that has absolute unconditional value? And he says, yes. First he says a man, meaning a human being, and then he says a rational creature, which brings up all sorts of difficulties in moral philosophy or ethics that we won't get into. Basically, he says that human beings, because they are rational creatures, and maybe there are other sorts of rational creatures that would also qualify, but who are not human beings and not human, but at least human beings, because they are rational, have inherent worth. Now, the, I would say, the, not defense, the explication of this is in the distinction between persons and things. The objects that surround us, and Kant would say the animals that surround us, too, living creatures who are not rational, these are things. 
They have no inherent worth. They have only a relative worth. And therefore, it's legitimate to use them as means. Means meaning instrument, a way, a tool. To use them as means to an end. The, the hamburger has no inherent worth. It has only relative worth. Therefore, I can use it as a means to satisfying the end of my being hungry, or the satisfying my hunger. Um, the, uh, the pen has no inherent worth, so I can use it as a means to writing something down, which would be the end. And that's perfectly legitimate if we're dealing with things. On the other hand, if we're dealing with persons, we're dealing with things that have inherent worth. And things that have inherent worth, Kant says, need to be respected. They need to be treated with respect. And what does that mean to him? It means treating them as an end in themselves and never as a means, never as a means to an end. So what is the categorical imperative, as you'll see, that comes out of it, the, the practical rule of morality? Uh, treat a person, whether yourself or someone else, always as an end in themselves, never as a means, which sort of boils down to never use a person and always treat a person with respect, which means treating them as an, as an end in themselves. And what would this mean? Uh, for instance, um, what would it mean to Kelly's situation in Chapter 2 of, of, of Hold Paramount? Uh, she knows that her company is um, releasing a certain form of chromium, taking advantage of a loophole in the regulations to release a toxic form of chromium into the environment, and, and she's asking herself whether she um, can tolerate this for the sake of herself, her job, her family, it needs the money for the sake of the company, etc. Well, if she were to apply Kant's uh, second version of the categorical paradigm, I think clearly she would realize she couldn't do that. Uh, she's interested in her own happiness, she's interested in the happiness of her parents who are financially dependent upon her. And perhaps she's interested in the happiness of the people who work in her company. Uh, she wants to preserve that happiness. But in order to do that, uh, she would have to tolerate the continued release of toxins into the environment, which potentially put a whole community, everyone who is uh, in the environment who would come into contact with those toxins in the land or the water or the air, putting them at risk of illness and death. I think with a little bit of maybe thinking about it, the way we would put it uh, may vary, but I think clearly she would be using the public, using the persons in the, in the community as a means to her own ends of her personal happiness, the happiness of her family, and perhaps the well-being of her company. Uh, she would be disrespecting them. She would be using them as an instrument. I think if she were to apply Kant, uh, clearly she would not be able to continue doing what, she is, what she's doing, and she would be forced to do something about it, perhaps, to, to make sure that those innocent people were not any longer put at risk. No matter what the consequences were for her or her family or her company, it, it would be wrong. And, uh, you can't do things that are wrong and, and pretend that you're right. Uh, now, whether or not coming to this conclusion, which I think Kant would force her to come to, would mean that she would do the right thing, that's not guaranteed, right? Kant is not saying that once we think these things through, this is what we will do. His point is that once we think these things through, this is what we know we should do, whether we'll do it or not, is entirely a psychological matter on our own part. So I think that uh, Kant is uh, actually very interesting and useful in terms of a decision-making model. Now, whether you think it's the best one, uh, I don't know. There is uh, consequentialism, utilitarianism, and I think I'll make a brief video about that, too.